The 1984 Florida State football team gave Seminole fans a sneak preview of the young men who would face one of the toughest schedules in major college football. On picture day, no one could foresee the great triumphs and the heartbreaks that lay ahead in the 1984 season. An improved defense and a record-setting offense would take the Seminoles to yet another postseason bowl game. Emotion filled Doak Campbell Stadium as Chief Osceola and Renegade kicked off another Seminole uprising. The 1984 Florida State highlight film is brought to you through the support of Sun Banks. Hopes were high as fans, coaches, and players set lofty goals for this new team. East Carolina was the first opponent, and the Knolls chose to begin their attack on the ground. Tied at three apiece, Cletus Jones picked up 20 yards. Rosie Snipes followed punishing blocking to give FSU a 10-3 lead. A reverse to Darren Holloman, a freshman, clicked for 13 yards and another score. On the ensuing kickoff, one of their own blockers caused a fumble and number 99, Bruce Hagee, recovered. Two plays later, quarterback Eric Thomas found Hassan Jones in the end zone and it was 24-3 FSU. Not to be outdone, the defense and number eight, Eric Riley, intercepts. Eric Thomas wasted little time in connecting with Jesse Hester for a touchdown and a 31-3 lead. Heisman Trophy candidate Greg Allen hurtled in for six and the Seminoles went on to crush East Carolina 48-17. In most colleges across America, some things never change. And so it was with FSU's explosive offense as it traveled to Lawrence, Kansas. Today's game against Kansas would be a clinic given by the Seminoles in all phases of the game. Number 47, Brian Williams, and number 58, Henry Taylor, began the lesson on sacking. Daryl Gray picked one off. Number 79, Gerald Nichols, got some help from his friends. And the new defense under Mickey Andrews looked conspicuously improved. The special teams, led by number five, Joe Wessel, did their job. And the defense, playing under new management, was showing early signs of dependability. Kansas did manage an early field goal, but Eric Thomas hit Hassan Jones to erase that lead, seven to three. The offensive line opened gaping holes for FSU runners. Gray Gallon carried to the 50. Cletus Jones took it the rest of the way behind precision blocking by the entire front line. The nationally recognized Florida State offense was living up to its reputation. Greg Allen scored twice to make it 28 to 10 FSU. Kansas tried a new quarterback with the same results. Martin Mayhew picked this one off. The Seminoles simply outclassed the Jayhawks in a 42-16 win. Head coach Bobby Bowden joked with Miami's Jimmy Johnson, but defending national champion Miami wasn't sure FSU could handle the faster track in South Florida. The Seminole faithful knew this would be the real test for Florida State's new defense. So we were really practicing hard. You know, Coach Bowden emphasized to the defense that we needed to put pressure on Kozar. Bobby Bowden called for pressure, and number 31, Billy Allen, delivered. 
The offense was to keep the ball away from Miami as long as they could. Eric Thomas and Jesse Hester connected on another big first down. Derek Schmidt made the Seminoles first drive count with the longest field goal in FSU history, a 54 yarder. He added a 40 yarder on their next possession to give Florida State a six to nothing lead. In the meantime, All-American Bernie Kosar was running for his life. An old secondary blanketed Miami receivers and the front four for Florida State were on fire. While Williams and Scott were burying Kozar, the offense was planning a patented Bobby Bowden surprise. Coach Bowden, he put the play in the week before, and we worked on it all week. So, you know, the situation presented itself. We were deep uh, about a 20 or 30 yard line, and, you know, they had been giving us the reverse, the reverse, reverse. So we came back with the pass, and, you know, I came around, and Jesse, you know, he broke to the corner. I threw it out there, and Jesse, you know, he jumped up and caught it, and it was good for about 40 yards. The offense ground out another field goal to take a precarious 9 to nothing lead. Number 68 Lenny Chavers forced a fumble and number 58 Henry Taylor recovered. The defense continued to challenge Miami and number 17 Eric Williams stole a sure first down. The interception gave Florida State a thin 9 to nothing lead at the half. We'd worked very hard for that nine points. We'd driven down and kicked a field goal, driven down and kicked another field goal, driven down and kicked another field goal. That's a very slow way to put nine points on the board. So at the half, we had about a third down and a 17, I think, or 12, and we were down our end of the field where we didn't want to risk turning the ball over. We knew they'd be looking for the forward pass. So we ran the reverse, and Jesse uh, made the best run he's made since he's been at Florida State when he ran 77 yards for a touchdown. Eric Thomas faked a handoff, and Hester and Greg Allen crisscrossed in the backfield, confusing Miami defenders. The offensive line maintained their blocks, and Jesse Hester's God-given speed did the rest. It was Florida State's first possession of the second half, and it was a 77-yard touchdown run. The try for two was good, and it was 17 to nothing, Florida State. From the 26-yard line, play fake by Thomas. Thomas still has a ball, throws it downfield toward Hassan Jones. Touchdown of issue! Hassan Jones in the end zone. Perfect pass by Eric Thomas. That strike to Jones put Miami on their knees, and it was becoming a Tallahassee lashing. When Rosie Snipes took it in less than two minutes later for the final Seminole score, the lights went out for Miami. this day, the Seminoles added South Florida to their domain. It was the defense's finest hour. Um, our defense has played a fantastic game, probably one of the greatest games I've ever seen, you know, in college football as far as playing against somebody of that caliber. For one, it was a total team effort. Offense played well, defense played great. I think we really came together in that game. Florida State was 3-0, and it destroyed the defending national champion. The excitement carried into the next game against a stubborn Temple University team. Temple met Joe Wessel. Every spring, we try to find a guy that has natural ability in blocking a punt. Bobby Butler with the Atlanta Falcons was a great punt blocker. Uh, uh, Hannah, uh, Warren Hannah was a good punt blocker for Florida State. But Joe Wessel has topped them all, and he is the slowest and the most likely of any punt blocker we've had here. And yet he was in on, he, he was, he's the best punt blocker probably the nation ever produced in college football up to this time. 
Number five, Joe Wessel, began his special brand of havoc in the first quarter. John Eford recovered for FSU. That set up a 43-yard touchdown run by All-American Greg Allen. He leaves behind the records for most touchdowns scored, most yards gained, and highest average per carry. Although he missed most of the last four games, he remains Florida State's all-time leading rusher. Still in the first quarter, Joe Wessel smothered a field goal attempt. And number eight, Eric Riley picked it up and ran 34 yards for the score. That made it 14 to nothing, FSU. The defense was intimidating the school from Philadelphia and finally took the ball away from them. Eric Thomas teamed with Jesse Hester and Hassan Jones for TDs and Florida State Mall Temple 44 to 27. The game was another showcase for number four, senior receiver Jesse Hester. He went on to lead the Seminoles in receiving in 1984 with 42 catches. Florida State tied Memphis State the following week and came home to fourth-ranked Auburn. The Tigers took the lead 10 to 3. Eric Thomas hit Pete Patton to tie the game at 10. Auburn, however, came back with two more scores to open a 22 to 10 lead. Thomas went to the bomb, and Jesse Hester never changed stride. At 22 to 17, the stage turned sour on the Seminoles. On what may be the most bizarre play of the 1984 season, FSU kicked off and caused a fumble on the run back. In the pileup, the ball popped up into the hands of a surprised Auburn player who ran untouched for an easy touchdown. It was 29 to 17, and time to see if Florida State had the character to fight back. Darren Holloman on a reverse, followed key blocks and scored. The defense and Isaac Williams stayed tough. Eric Thomas hit Hassan Jones to take the lead, and the Seminoles made it 32 to 29 with a two-point conversion. Rosie Snipes picked up big chunks of yardage. Eric Thomas again found Hassan Jones in the corner to go ahead 41 to 35. But Auburn scored with time running out to escape again by a whisker at a touch of good fortune. FSU buried Tulane the next week 27 to 6. And a real live Western hero would be needed against Pac-10 power Arizona State in Tempe. 96 points were scored in this shootout in the desert. Arizona State plays to a 17 to nothing lead early. Greg Allen ran for 223 yards on just 10 carries. Kirk Coker replaced injured Eric Thomas at quarterback and threw for 203 yards and two touchdowns. But the Sun Devils kept pouring it on. Bobby Bowden called for the special teams and real help was on the way. Lenny Chavers blocked a punt 
and number five, Joe Wessel, began his heroics. Joe Wessel broke Florida State and NCAA records with five blocked kicks and three returns for touchdowns in 1984. Joe Wessel's two returns for touchdowns carried the Knolls to a dramatic 52-44 win over Arizona State. The following week, FSU lost a heartbreaker to South Carolina and then shut out Tennessee Chattanooga 37 to nothing. Then got ready for arch rival Florida. They lined up for this one. For the Seminoles, it was their second national telecast in their last three games. The game was heard over the 70 station Seminole Sports Network. The sellout crowd saw a partly sunny pre-game show turn to swirling winds and an ugly dark sky. The sight of injured star running back Greg Allen in street clothes made the setting even more ominous. And the hand dealt the Seminoles on this dreary December day was as dark as the weather. The Seminoles fought to overcome a 17-3 halftime deficit. But the Sunbank scoreboard knew the key to FSU's fate in 1984. The rain stopped and Brian McCrary and Florida State came alive. The replacement for injured Greg Allen was number 49, Tony Smith, a junior who fought for 14 punishing yards. That run set up Eric Thomas's pass to freshman Pat Carter for a seminal touchdown. Kirk Coker hit Jesse Hester for another score, but it was too little, too late, as Florida won it 27 to 17. The loss did little to dampen the spirits of the Seminoles, who were bound for the Citrus Bowl. We were always looking forward to playing the University of Georgia, but we knew that they would never play us, and we would never go up to Stanford Stadium and play them. So being matched in the Citrus Bowl was uh, sort of a dream come true. A national TV audience saw Florida State face Georgia, a school they hadn't played in 20 years. Bobby Bowden saw his tribe fall behind again, this time 14 to nothing at the half. The defense was playing solid football. Fred Jones's sack inspired the offense. The drive stall there, and it was time for the Joe Wessel and Lenny Chavers show. This time, Lenny blocked it, and Joe took it in. The critical two-point play to tie the game was too slick for cameramen to follow. The play went left after a tremendous fake right by Eric Thomas. Number 24, Darren Holloman tied it at 17. And Florida State had come back again from what seemed like sure defeat. The tie was a... Uh, uh, really uh, an in indicative of the way our team fought in, during the 1984 season. 
Our kids came back and fought like mad in the fourth quarter of every ball game and came back and tied that ball game and uh, when it looked like everything else was futile. We have a lot of people coming back, a lot of people that are, you know, have the attitude and have the desire to win, and so I'm looking for a real good year next year. We had an uh, excellent year recruiting, 1983, and we think we're having a good year recruiting this year. So you just keep trying to put these things back to back, and then get a little break in here somewhere where you get that extra little one point that you need, see? That's the only thing that's separating us uh, from the top teams in the nation. We never quit. I think we fought every team to the end, to the last whistle, and I think that's the biggest thing that characterizes this team. Many of the players on this team that wouldn't quit are returning. The Seminoles were just four points shy of a 10-2 season in 84, and to many sports writers, Florida State may be the team to beat in 1985. On behalf of Florida State University, the football coaches, and the football team, we want to thank Sunbank for the great support they've given our Florida State football program, and especially for this FSU football highlight Sunbank film. The 1986 football season saw Florida State University football once again whirling with excitement. Seminole players showcased their talents against one of the toughest schedules in the land. Tested both emotionally and physically, this team rose to the challenge to spend another year in the sun. season we looked like a football team that had a, a very competitive schedule uh, that three of the best teams in the nation away and you had a football team that had the potential of winning some of those games after a season opening win against Toledo coach Bowden's Seminoles were immediately thrust into the heat of their schedule Nebraska head up nose to nose in Lincoln and Michigan ranked fifth before over 105,000 partisan Wolverine fans. FSU responded to those challenges in the only way a state team would, determined to bring another big road win back to Tallahassee. Out of the bag of tricks popped freshman Sammy Smith on a fake reverse. 57 yards later, the Seminoles had the Nebraska faithful sitting on their hands and trailing 14 to 10 at the half. The Knowles lead would evaporate, but something was taken from the loss. This team had the character to win. The Michigan game marked quarterback Danny McManus's return to action from injury for the first time in over a year. Our quarterback coach Mark Rick told me just go in there and act like it's uh, Pascal, something that we do in practice. 
And he said, whatever happens, happens. The guys up front when I got in the huddle said, okay, let's just get one right here. And we moved down the field, and uh, once Michigan moved up to take away the short game, we went over to the top, and Herb made a great catch in the corner of the end zone. It's like um, what Vince Lombardi said, we never lost, we just ran out of time. But I think if we had a little couple more minutes, we might have been able to pull that one out. The 1986 Seminole character was born those days in Michigan and Nebraska. Its excitement was evident any time FSU stepped onto the field, especially when the maroon and gold had the ball. The offense went into the year with a lot of potential, but it was strictly unproven, like Sammy Smith at tailback. The quarterback, unproven, we ended up playing several freshman receivers that have, as you can, if you might have saw him play, can tell him, boy, he got some really outstanding potential. I was hoping we could cash in immediately on their ability. A coach's hopes many times go unrewarded. Not so at Florida State. In wins over Tulane, Wichita State, and Louisville, the Seminole offense exploded for over 50 points. For the season, State once again finished ranked in the nation's top 10 in pass offense, total offense, and scoring offense, a tribute to the Bobby Bowden offensive scheme. They never know what we're going to do. When they think we're going to run the ball, we'll probably will pass it. When they think we're going to pass, we're probably going to run. He's the kind of coach that um, you can't really predict what he's going to do. You can get all the computers and all the stuff you want like that, but you're really never sure what he's going to do. As unpredictable as the offense is, one thing is certain in Seminole land. That's entertainment. Florida State fans are excitable, passionate, and involved. Get up, defense! Get up, get up, get up! One of the biggest attractions at Doak Campbell Stadium walks the West sidelines. Its name? Robert hey, listen, Clecker listen. Bowden. I, I call it 344. And I want, who would you hit? Carolina an X or a post or a Z or a post? Uh, would it be a zebra X post or a Cadillac Z post? I mean, are they spotting on X on that corner where I could hit him on a post? Good job on your screen. You've got it open on both sides. We'll keep throwing that thing here, baby. That's just like sweet. If it ain't over on Texas, it's on the other side. You got it both ways. Good job. Hey, Wayne, we might all start running this time. How, how did they stop our sweep, man? Who, 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 we got to do something about this press now. You got to get back deep, set, and fire, and you're not doing it. That ain't like you. Yeah, get back deep, set, and hold the ball fire. But when you get pressure, throw that ball away. And we had a takeoff on a while ago, and you ate the ball, see? 344, zebra X corner. Safety plays way back, hit your square end. If he comes up tight, we no, go to the top. During Coach Bowden's years at Florida State, many packed stadium crowds have roared approval at Seminole teams. 1986 was the 10th straight winning FSU season and 8th bowl trip. Whether on television or in person, it's little wonder why everybody wants to see Florida State in action. Seminoles have used... Uh about six running backs in this game. Keith Ross, Victor Floyd. Seminole fans following the Knowles season gathered around radios or journeyed to Miami for the annual Kane Classic. It's a first down carry on a toss sweep to the right side, the short side of the field. Miami's Heisman Trophy quarterback, Vinny Testaverde, found the FSU defense tough going. A 
alert play by the FSU secondary, plus hard charging by the line and linebackers, kept the high-scoring Miami team wondering what's next. The Seminoles had the Hurricanes in the hole for the first half. The only team to do so at the half in the 1986 season. Second half action found the visiting Seminoles lose the lead and key players Sammy Smith and Danny McManus to injury. But once again, FSU coaches were pleased with the intensity and positive signal shown at the Orange Bowl. South Carolina fans dressed in black turned out in droves to see what a Seminole looked like. Playing to another tough road crowd, FSU fell behind 21 to six and awaited a spark to ignite a comeback. Junior defensive tackle Bart Shute Sack seemed to do the trick. Cornerback Deion Sanders stoked the freshly lit comeback flame with a dazzling punt return. Sophomore quarterback Chip Ferguson played fire starter in place of the injured McManus. Number five's 29-yard sizzler to tailback Victor Floyd capped State's first TD drive. FSU's hard work at specialty team play was emphasized as sophomore return specialist Keith Ross burnt Carolina with a long one. Ferguson broke out the Knolls' multiple offense. Before anything could be detected, the Seminoles were engulfing huge chunks of yardage. Floyd's seven-yard touchdown finally sounded the Gamecocks' smoke alarm. What had started as a mere spark had grown into a full-blown Seminole blaze. Junior tight end Pat Carter's catch for a conversion signaled the game had reached a 21 alarmer. Florida State's hot hand, or in this case, feet, belonged to Floyd. His 115 yards on 24 carries helped the Seminoles to control the tempo of the game and take the lead. There was no relief in sight for the home folks as FSU's defense doused any embers of South Carolina hope. The defense joined in the total team effort given by Florida State for one of its biggest come from behind victories in recent history. Sophomore fullback Dane Williams collected his second touchdown as the Seminoles added Columbia, South Carolina to Coach Bowden's incredible 40, 24, and two road success record. There's something special about homecoming weekends. Getting to visit with the old buddies, picking up the newest in university survival equipment, or just enjoying some warm sun in a friendly atmosphere before the big game. 
Florida State's once a year reunion ranks among the nation's best outdoor gatherings. Because of its diverse student and alumni population, it's a people watcher heaven. Homecoming 86 saw 60,103 fans witness on Doak Campbell Stadium turf their Seminoles offense play that special notch higher. Quarterback Danny McManus returned to light the scoreboard early and often. Dane Williams' nine-yard run. Victor Floyd's three-yard run. Keith Ross's two-yard run. A Ferguson to Tom O'Malley, 14-yard pass. Defensively, it was a near-perfect execution, highlighted by quarterback sacks and key interceptions. We love to make big plays, you know, because we made a lot of big plays. We had more interceptions, and, you know, I don't know how many more sacks we had, but we, we you know, we caused more big plays. Yard line, Anderson wants to throw. Looking for time, gets the pass away. It's picked off by Dodge. Dodge to the 40, to the 35, to the 30. He may go. Dodge waiting for a block of the five. He goes in. Touchdown, Florida State. Dedrick Dodge, interception return. Darrell Tillman, Chris McGee, the wide receivers. Anderson wants to throw, gets the pass away. It's picked off. Eric Williams down the near sideline to the 30, 25, 20. He'll go all the way. Touchdown, Florida State. The 49 to 13 win assured Florida State of its 11th homecoming victory in a row. But the thing that will be remembered most is the emergence of a running back with the number 33 on his chest. 38 yard line, head off goes to Sammy Smith. The big guy gets into the daylight. He's to the 50. He's down the near sideline to the 45, to the 40. He's to the 30, a foot race is under the 20. For the 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Sammy Smith. He has the ability to be the best running back we've ever had at Florida State. He has that kind of ability. Now, it's going to come down to how bad he wants it and how much he's willing to work for it. Uh, because so much of his talent is natural. It's, sometimes it's hard to get a young man who has natural talent to work as hard as a man that doesn't have natural talent. And Sammy has got so much natural talent, it's, it's unbelievable. Six foot, two inches tall. 219 pounds of raw muscle waiting to run. Well, I just want to play well. You know, I had a very good ending here this last season and I, if I can just pick up next year and the next year and the next year and finish like I did this year, I'll be, I think my goals will be fulfilled. In the mud and rain against state rival Florida, Sammy Smith rushed for 116 yards on 24 tough carries for one touchdown. Tallahassee fans' hopes of victory rode on Sammy's broad shoulders, only to have them negated by a single play. The play was a sweep that was designed to go to the right, but as I got the ball, I saw that I wasn't going to be able to get outside, and I cut it back across the grain and went left. And, you know, we had some great blocks, and they sprung me, and I scored.
when I looked back and saw the flag and you know all the guys that were running down to celebrate hadn't seen it yet I was very hurt and I'm sure that all the rest of the guys were too when they saw the flag because we felt at that point we could win the game you know and I talked to even some of the Florida players and you know they told me that at that point that they had given up a lot of guys would have been very um, I guess disheartened with uh, ending the season on a loss to Florida now we got to go show America one more time what we're able to do and it gives us a good foundation for next year the All-American Bowl was the perfect choice to begin groundbreaking for 1987. You know, it helps recruiting and it helps, you know, the team morale. And you like to go to a bowl and win and end at that note, you know, for the beginning of next season. For a team that survived seven tests in the 1986 season, a bowl berth is like a pat on the back and recognition for a season full of hard work and accomplishment. Florida State was just such a team. FSU outclassed its opponent, Indiana, and cruised past the Hoosiers 27 to 13. In winning the bowl, State extended its undefeated bowl streak to five games. We had a good time as an offensive line. Mostly uh, the offense, I think the offensive line played great. You know, we pretty much, I thought we controlled their defensive line pretty much through the whole game. If the Florida game had been Sammy Smith's birth as a great runner, the bowl performance was his christening. Smith ran for a career high 205 yards and received the game's most valuable player award. With three years remaining at FSU, Smith seems destined to rewrite the Seminole record books and make numerous end zone visits. future celebrations will be made possible by a veteran offensive line anchored by All-America tackle Pat Tomberlin and line mates Joe Iannotta, Jason Kuypers, and Mark Salva. Based on the solid bowl outing where the defense surrendered only 13 points, fortunes look bright. FSU's leading tackler the past two seasons all-American linebacker Paul McGowan returns to lead a hard-nosed group. Deion Sanders' sparkling sophomore season garnered him an All-American selection in the secondary and gives the Knowles a guardian against the deep threat. Danny McManus returns a quarterback for his final year, along with every FSU snap taker of 1986. Split end Herb Gaynor will once again head a matured receiver core that stacks up to any in the country. Place kicker Derek Schmidt's accurate toe is back, gunning for the one point needed to become FSU's all-time scoring leader. We're going into next year with just about the same ball club we had in 1986. We lost three starters and then lost about six boys that played and a good punter, so we lose them. But it's a lot of other players with experience coming back. Now, if these boys will pay the price that uh, has to be paid to win on Saturdays, uh, with their experience and with another year of maturity, we, we've got a chance next year to challenge for, uh, for a championship. Coach Bowden and his coaching staff and the Florida State players seem poised on the edge of making 1987 a championship season. The ability and talent are present. Hard work and determination in reaching that summit are all that is needed for realization of that goal for a championship season. 1986 was a very exciting year, and I think a lot of the excitement came from people realizing the potential of the future of this Florida State football team. And I want to thank the Sunbanks of Florida for making this film possible. <laughs>